I don't like to use myself, but I, I am the only inner man I know. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been built firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you've been instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today at this time and we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for giving your son. But we also pray for the church to hear this message, to have me be able to preach it. Oh, Father, you know I don't want to preach this thunderous. Please control me. Keep this stuff inside me in a control. In Jesus' name, we pray. As it starts out, it says, therefore. But what's the there, therefore? Let's look at Colossians 2, 1 through 7. I would expect a lot of problems on this sermon. If you have your Bible, you might want to get there. Uh, Colossians 2, 1 through 7. What is the therefore, therefore? Anyhow, let's just get get her done. Colossians 2, 1 through 7. This is why the there is therefore. For I, Paul, want you to know how great of a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are in Laodicea, for all those who have not personally seen my face, for their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes for the full assurance of the understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures and wisdom of, and knowledge. I say this so no one deludes you with persuasive arguments, for even though I am absent in the body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and your stability in the faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Therefore, is the context of the verses ahead of you, ahead of it. The true knowledge of God's mystery, God's Christ himself, hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, that no one may delude you with persuasive arguments, rejoicing to see your good discipline. And he says, in the stability of your stability of your faith in Christ. Paul heard that there was some false teaching going on in Colossae, and it was. It was mainly the Gnostics. And there is false teaching around us all over the place. But Paul is going to give us a remedy and the church a remedy to keep us in the truth. And it is really important. Point one, if you have your Bible, you might want to get there or go to uh, your phone or whatever you use. Point one, Colossians 2. Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, receive Christ Jesus the Lord, the Lord, the authority, We as humans really don't like to be told much what to do. Some humans have trouble with authority, even the simple things. The speed limit is 65. We go 75 sometimes and not even concerned. How about being on time or obeying the hunting and fishing laws? And then there's worse things. It also seems that people are not really concerned about doing wrong anymore. People say it's not if we do wrong, it's if we get caught. The world's authority has got soft. But we live, if we lived in a dictatorship, we would act differently. But in the US, we talk about all the authorities of our country, the president, the vice president, and the governors with little or no respect or concern. People across this country call police all kinds of rotten things. Little or no respect for authority. Then we receive Christ Jesus, the Lord. The kingdom of God is a monarchy. 
What the King Jesus, the Lord, says is absolute. In the model prayer, some people call it the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 6, if you want to turn there, I'll wait, because I'm used to people turning in their Bibles. Matthew 6, 9 through 10. People call it the Lord's Prayer. I call it the model prayer. It doesn't really matter. What it matters is what it says. Jesus said, pray then this way. You, you all know it by, off by heart. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be his, your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Listen, on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. People say that all the time and they don't even know what they're really saying. The church of God is the kingdom, God's kingdom on earth. It's God's will is total authority in the church and his people like he does in heaven. It is God's will. Jesus is God. And I look at this as an adventure, and it truly has been. See, Jesus is God, and what can he do with a guy like me? What could God do with you? God is good. Remember the context that we read. In Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. John the baptizer said this about Jesus in John 3.30. You can turn there. I'll wait. It's an incredible, incredible thing that John the Baptist said about Jesus. It doesn't surprise me at all. <clears throat> John 3.30, John says this, He must increase, but I must decrease. Why? Jesus is Lord and he is our king. Church, when we were biblically baptized, we received the Holy Spirit to help us. We are not totally fleshing this out. But when a person does this in his personal life, that Jesus must increase as I must decrease, you get a brutal reality of self. You kind of relate to what Paul writes in Romans. But you also find the reality of how merciful the Lord Jesus Christ is. It's where the rubber hits the road. He must increase as we decrease. God's kingdom, the church, has an authority, and it is absolute. Any authority other than Jesus Christ and his apostles for the church is a word called usurp. You probably haven't even heard of that word. It's not used much. It means taken without right. You would understand mutiny, treason. And Jesus is the judge, not me. Point two. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. What does walking in Jesus mean? What's it look like? How do we walk like Jesus is our Lord. The Bible teaches us that John, I'm sorry, that Jesus said this in Matthew 8. I really want you to go because this is a scripture that has rattled my life. John 8, 34. People, it's so important, brothers, sisters, and friends, to understand this authority. In Mark 8, 34, it says, Then when he, Jesus, had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. 
Who is Jesus talking to? In the context, it's the people and his disciples. But he also says this, whoever desires to come after me, Jesus. Lordship is about denying self, picking up your own cross, and following Jesus. When I was in my middle 30s, you guys won't even relate to this, you young girls. We didn't have the internet. All I had was this. And I was a new Christian. I was only a couple years old. And it wasn't this church. It was another church back east. And I couldn't understand this verse. Deny self. Pick up your cross and follow him. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters and friends, it was months I couldn't sleep. I needed to understand it. Yes, it's words on a page, but what does it mean? What does it mean? All I had was the Bible. So I'd just crush it and crush it and crush it. And I would tremble because I can't understand this. See, I came from the world. Everything's about self. Everything's about self. And then I came into the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's saying, deny self? What does it mean? So as a young guy in my middle 30s, I went to people in the church and I'd say, what does this mean? Deny self, pick up your cross and follow him. Whoever wants to save his life, lose it. But whoever loses my, his life for the gospel and my sake will gain it. What's it mean? And it wasn't very good. Oh, people just look at it like it's words on a paper. But what does it really, really mean? Oh, church, what does it really, really mean? Then I went to my elder. I'm new in the, in the faith. Okay, I've only read the Bible a couple times from Genesis to Maps, point. And I was just a young guy in the faith. And I went to my elder and I said, what does this mean? And I'm trembling and he knows it. Okay, and I said, what does this mean? And this is what he said. Dan, you need to relax. In a couple years, you'll be just like me. And it just Fire come out of my mouth. I don't want to be like you. I want to be like Jesus. Then I did the dumbest thing that almost nobody would ever do. See, I'm teaching this and sharing this with you so that you can realize that this dumb guy can figure this out. Anybody can. So I don't know what else to do. So I go to the Christian bookstore back east, and I walk in, and I first time I've been there, I just had a Bible. And I've seen all these books on everything you can imagine. So it was Saturday morning because everybody works. So Saturday morning I go in there and the place is crowded. And I walked up to the cash register and she says, can I help you? I said, yes. Do you have any books on self-death? And instantly the church, the, the people in the bookstore went, what church do you go to? What does it mean? It's just not paper. It's not just pages on paper. And this is what it means. It means to deny self, not your spouse, not, not someone else, yourself, you, yourself, the one between your ears, the one between my ears. And it says what? Let him deny himself. It is a self-willed action it's our decision and our responsibility only. All the blessings of God come through submission and obedience. Submission and obedience. We are to deny ourselves, submit, because we know that Jesus is our Lord and we are only people. I personally use the word master. Sometimes it's like taking two steps forward and ten steps backwards. It's a learning as you walk deal. Do you know who is in the way of you getting closer to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know who that is? It's yourself. It's the one between your ears. This is a huge point. Everything is a positive and everything's a negative. But this is a huge point. See, we are in the driver's seat on this one. Yes, the church leadership has a responsibility for our spiritual growth. However, ever, our self has the biggest responsibility of our own growth. This is such a great point of lordship. This is where we is personal. Let him deny himself and follow Jesus. You know, Christianity isn't a spectator sport. I get excited about that. You know, we can do better. 
It's not what most people want to hear. To deny self. To be submissive. But the Colossians 2 says, for walk in him. When I was young and 30 in the, in the faith, they had these WWJD bracelets. You, I don't know if you, some of you remember, you still see them today. They have the hats and they have all that stuff. But the question I have to ask is how could you do what Jesus would do if you didn't know, don't know what Jesus did? It's kind of like where the rubber hits the road. To deny self, Jesus must increase as we decrease. It's Jesus' way over our way. It is Jesus' will, not our will. To love people even when we don't want to. You know, absolute lordship. Harold put a challenge to the church, 126 members in 1026. And Harold said to himself, it's not about the numbers. No, <laughs> it's not about the numbers. It's about obedience. To walk as Jesus is your Lord and my Lord and to do what Jesus would do. Lordship, to be Jesus-focused, to be Jesus-glorifying, to be Jesus-motivated. It's all about Jesus' will. We are to deny ourselves, not deceive ourselves. Colossians, back to Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted. Having been firmly rooted, steadfast, rooted, where you get your nourishment, grounded, not moving from the hope you have in Christ. Oh, Jesus is all you want, and Jesus is all you need. It's always about Jesus. Colossians 2, 6 and 7, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him. Built up in his word. This is where you find out that the word is alive and God builds us up in his word. We find who God is and we find his ways and we find out that he is real and we find our own purpose of God's will. The word of God makes us faith strong. In Romans 10, 17, you've all heard it. For faith comes from hearing and hearing the words of Christ. You want more faith? Read more. Okay? I'm not a doctor, but I can kind of figure this out. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 You've heard this probably many, many times, but I'm going to read it real slow so people can get it. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You know, we might have troubles finding time reading the Bible. You ever hear, anybody ever hear, well, when I get around to it? Has anybody ever heard that? You have? Okay, well, here it is. Guess what it, this is? When you get around to it, so here's your round to it. I'm not a guy that's going to take excuses. You know, I'm just not. But I can help you if you need help, though. Jesus says, deny self. We all get 168 hours a week. I hope we can all do better. And those who have reasons or excuse, excuses not to read his word and become like Jesus, do not tell me. I do not relate. I'll tell you who to tell. Tell the one that was mocked stripped, the one that had nails in his hands and feet, the one that died for you. He already knows. It just might help you to confess that to him. My question, brothers and sisters and friends, is your prayer life just bless me, take care of me, love it, or do you really spend time in sharing the inner person that you have and your fears and your needs for an almighty Savior? I didn't say that to whop you. I gave, said that to help you. 
If your prayer life isn't like that, change immediately. You will not believe what God can do. Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus. Point five, if you're there. Okay. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now built up in him and established in your faith. The faith. It is singular. Ephesians chapter 4, verse Four, there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. One faith. It makes sense that it's just one book. Just one book. Not three, not five, no confessions of faith, just one book. The Bible one, the God-breathed one. Now, I know there's all kinds of different translations out there, and people have their debates of what this and what that is. I just have one stance. I just think all Bibles should be read. Oh, it's black. You know what I mean. The text states established in the faith. The New King James says that, and in the Greek it says that. But what faith? Jude says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude is telling Christians to look back to the one faith that was once delivered to all the saints. And God's telling us to contend. Contend doesn't mean beating people over the head with this. Contend means finding out where they are and helping them. It, contend just means it's an attitude. It isn't like a war or beating people that if they believe different, but just to open us up and teach them. See, God is calling his people to be contenders, not compromisers or conformers. Jesus is Lord, and there is only one faith. Point six. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted, now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you've been instructed. Here is the biggest need in the church, to teach and disciple people in the biblical faith while they are reading their Bible on their own. As they are reading the Bible on their own. As they are reading their Bible on their own. Another thing is, is you can't be taught unless you're a student. Do you know why the angels appeared to the women at the empty grave. This is just how I look at things. Because they were there. Because they were there. What a concept. Bible here is getting taught on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. and Wednesday evening at 7. To the ones that are here. If you need help, if you need talk, If you have need questions, just let this church know. Call Harold or me. There's so many other people here that can help you. Point seven. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now built up in him and established in your faith just as you've been instructed and overflowing with gratitude overflowing with gratitude, large amounts of thankfulness. It overpowers your personality to be thankful to God giving his son, for Jesus giving his life, for God giving us the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for God forgiving us when we confess our sins as we fail, as him, as our Lord. Thank you for the Lord God that he is full of mercy and loving kindness. Thank you for the opportunity to get involved in the greatest opportunity in the world. Peace with God and eternal life in his kingdom. Thank you for the workers of the church. Thank you for God's 
family, the church. Church family is the biggest, heaviest, sometimes burden on my heart. My earthly family, I'm just going to say, was not very good. And it's the biggest hole. It was the biggest hole you could drive a semi through of my inner man. And the Lord gave me dozen, over a dozen of mothers in Christ as I filled the pulpits across the east. Women would come up to me and hug me and say, you are my son, I am your mother. And they're all way over 100, 110, 120, most of them have passed. All these dear saints. See, I was never a young preacher. I started preaching when I was in the middle 40s. Due to Facebook, a couple years ago, I friended an old saint of mine, and she said, this is your mother. And, and, and I got the greatest father who is in heaven. People, I'm trying to let you know that God is real. He gave me a mothers and mothers and mothers and a father who is in heaven. He gave me everything I ever needed. Walking as Jesus is Lord, rooted and built up in him. In the faith, we see and know that Jesus is alive and he is very real. And the results is abounding in thanksgiving towards God and God's family. We see how great our Lord is. It is the greatest adventure in the world that will run through eternity. It is a relationship that cannot be explained except in thankfulness because we don't deserve it. It's God's mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. What a great God. And if you truly are thankful, I don't know about you, when I am truly frank, thankful, I am not critical. It's kind of like the two ends of the spectrum. But how can I be critical when I realize who I am as God, as lordship, how I fail? See, if we truly love this God, we will serve Jesus like a labor of love. And we get to be in the greatest message or the greatest mission of all, serving the Lord Jesus Christ and building his kingdom, his church. It will be a work of labor of love that will echo, echo, echo through eternity. Wow, it doesn't get any better than that. A few weeks ago, Larry preached and ended up with, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Yes, Jesus is coming back. I know I need to repent. I know I can do better in submission. And my prayer for the last three weeks with tears is that others would repent and could do better if needed. Why do you call me Lord and do not do as I say? The words of the Lord. Two weeks ago, Harold used the verse, and Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. You still have time. You're still alive. We're all still here. So let me tell you who this Jesus is. I'm going to go through the Bible it's very quickly. Jesus is creator. He is the Passover lamb. He is the scapegoat. He is the high priest, and he is the king. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the son of man. Jesus is the lamb of God. Jesus is the lion of Judah. Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus is the gate. He is the door. He is the true vine. He is the great shepherd. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. And Jesus is crucified. He is dead. He is buried. But death cannot hold God. He is alive, and Father, God has made him both Lord and Christ. He is the anointed one. He is Messiah. He is Lord, and he is Savior. Jesus is the head of his church. He has the keys to death in Hades. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And Jesus Christ is the king of all kings, 
Lord of all lords, but where the rubber hits the road, is he your Lord? Is he your Lord? Is he my Lord? I've preached this a, a number of times today. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, if you've never had the opportunity to have, accept and receive Jesus Christ the Lord, it's really amazing that God did this, and he also tells us how to be saved. In Matthew, a lot of people don't understand this, so I'm going to explain it. In chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Jesus began to preach. Okay, he followed suit with all the prophets. His first word was repent. Repent is awesome that God gives us. It's the ability to take this way and turn this way to Jesus. It's a, people say, well, well, didn't he preach love? Repentance is love. Repentance is love. You know, when he talked to people, he said, sin no more. That's repentance. And then in Mark 16, 16, it says, Jesus said, those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. So we must believe, we must obey, we must confess, we must do it. But we're going to go to Acts 2. If you got your Bible, please open there. Because the Church of Christ was where uh, shared the gospel with me 35 years ago, but he never explained it. And we just think that everybody understands it. Acts 2. So this is the sermon of the, the, in, in, Ma in Matthew 16. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And J Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And here he is opening the kingdom. If you look for in verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. See, they believed and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall I do? One of the greatest questions ever asked. And Peter said, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Two commands, repent and be baptized, and two promises, the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, baptism is the, is the beginning. It's not the end. It's the very start of Christianity. But listen to this. This is really important. For the promise is for you, the ones that heard that, and their children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God sh shall call to himself. Is anyone who the Lord calls to himself. I believe this is the Jude contending for the faith that was delivered to the one saint. Who is far off? We are. Who is the Lord calling? Maybe you. And here's the point. I'll be standing back there if anybody needs to talk, because the next question, or the next verse says, and with many other words, he, Peter, solemnly testified it and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. If you need more words or you have questions, I'll be standing in the back there as Larry comes up and finishes. I want you to have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Larry? <laughs>